It's often said that only someone like Tony Stark could save the world. And there's some truth to that. Within the next 50 to 100 years, our current energy sources like coal, natural gas, and crude oil will be depleted. With energy demand rising every day, it's vital that we find a permanent solution to power humanity's future. In the Iron Man movies, Tony Stark uses a compact fusion reactor embedded in his chest, and this fictional device offers limitless clean energy and operates on fuel that is abundantly available on Earth. But before we understand how a fusion reactor works, we need to understand how the sun generates energy. Because the sun itself is powered by nuclear fusion. Nuclear fusion occurs when the nuclei of two or more atoms combine to form a heavier nucleus. This process releases a tremendous amount of energy, depending on which atoms are being fused. The life of a star, like the sun, begins with an interstellar cloud made mostly of gas. 70% hydrogen, 28% helium, and just 2% heavier elements. At this early stage, it is called a protostar. Gravity starts to pull the gas inward, squeezing it towards the center. As the cloud compresses, its temperature rises. When the core temperature reaches around 10 million degrees Celsius, the first fusion reaction is triggered, marking the birth of a star. To initiate fusion, two key conditions are required. Extremely high temperature and very high pressure. Since the sun consists of mostly hydrogen, it's primarily hydrogen atoms that fuse in its core. Hydrogen is the first element in the periodic table and has a single proton in its nucleus. When fusion begins, temperatures soar past 10 million degrees Celsius. Under such heat and pressure, two hydrogen atoms fuse together. In these extreme conditions, the electrons are stripped from their atoms, separating from the protons. This state of matter is known as plasma, the fourth state of matter. An important point to note is that while more atoms continue fusing in the process, electrons don't play a direct role in fusion. In plasma, electrons are free and do not exist in bound form. When two hydrogen atoms fuse, one of the protons is converted into a neutron, forming deuterium, which has one proton and one neutron. This deuterium then fuses with another hydrogen atom to produce helium-3 and release significant energy. Later, helium-3 atoms fuse again to form helium-4 and release two hydrogen atoms. In this way, the fusion process continues, steadily progressing and releasing energy. But here's the challenge. Both hydrogen atoms have positively charged protons, and like charges repel. To form deuterium, one proton must convert into a neutron. This conversion is extremely slow and can take millions of years. That's why it took the sun more than 50 million years just to produce its first fusion spark. During this time, hydrogen atoms were subjected to extreme pressure and temperatures around 15 million degrees Celsius. Once that first spark occurred, fusion became continuous. Today, the sun fuses approximately one octillion protons per second. However, not all protons manage to fuse. Many continue to repel each other and drift for millions of years. In terms of volume, the Sun is about 1.3 million times larger than Earth and contains enough hydrogen to sustain fusion for roughly 10 billion years. It has already been burning for 4.6 billion years, which means nearly half its fuel still remains. The Sun is currently in its youthful phase. Just like the Sun generates energy through fusion, we replicate a similar process inside a nuclear fusion reactor. That's why it is often referred to as an artificial sun. However, unlike the sun, Earth doesn't naturally provide the extreme temperature and pressure needed. So we have to create these conditions ourselves. First, we construct a toroidal, that's a donut-shaped stainless steel tube. Inside this tube, deuterium and tritium gases are introduced. We can't use plain hydrogen atoms like the sun, since we don't have millions of years for fusion to initiate. So instead, we directly use deuterium and tritium. Deuterium is a heavier isotope of hydrogen. Think of it as hydrogen's bigger sibling. And since it's found in water, which is plentiful on Earth, it's easy to extract. In fact, one liter of water contains enough deuterium to power a person's electricity needs for their entire life. Tritium, on the other hand, is a radioactive isotope of hydrogen, and only about 20 kilograms of it exists on Earth. A mixture of 1 gram of deuterium and 1.5 grams of tritium is estimated to generate around 337 gigawatt hours of electricity. 
To put it in perspective, just one gram of fusion fuel can generate as much energy as 42,000 kilograms of coal. That's why fusion reactors are often called true energy powerhouses. But there's a catch. Tritium is currently extracted from the water used as a moderator in certain nuclear reactors, and even then in very small quantities. For instance, Kandu reactor produces only about 2.5 grams of tritium per year. That's why fusion reactors are designed to produce tritium during operation, which we'll discuss shortly. Now, to create plasma inside this tube, we need temperatures of around 10 million degrees Celsius, but no known metal can withstand this heat. So deuterium and tritium are suspended in air, not touching any solid surface. Surrounding the tube are superconducting magnets, extremely powerful ones. A short-circuited coil is placed within these magnets. This coil is excited just once using an external power source. As current flows through it, a magnetic field is generated around it. However, due to resistance in the coil, this current would normally convert to heat and fade over time. In these systems, currents as high as 68 kA flow through the coil, producing significant heat. To counter this, liquid helium is used for cooling, keeping the coil's temperature below its critical point. When kept at such low temperatures, resistance becomes nearly zero, turning the coil into a superconducting magnet, which generates a powerful magnetic field. This is the same principle used in Japan's maglev trains superconducting magnets, which float above the track without touching the surface. You can watch a detailed video on this concept on our channel. These magnetic fields guide the deuterium and tritium towards the center of the tube and prevent them from touching the walls. The particles also start rotating rapidly under the influence of the magnetic field. Additionally, superconducting magnets called poloidal field coils are used at the top and bottom ends of the reactor. These coils balance the fusion fuel in the center and keep it stable, compressing it from above and below. Together, all these superconducting magnets are cooled together using liquid helium, arranged in a very specific configuration. The combined magnetic field formed by these coils traps the deuterium and tritium in the center of the torus, holding them in the air, spinning at high speeds. So far, we've only brought the fusion fuel into a suspended state. Now begins the process of raising its temperature to form plasma. To create plasma, a central solenoid is placed inside the reactor. This is also a superconducting magnet, but its magnetic field is rapidly changing. This change in the magnetic field makes the solenoid act like the primary coil of a transformer, while the plasma behaves like a secondary coil. As plasma is made of free-moving electrons and ions, a current is naturally induced within it. This current causes the deuterium and tritium ions to accelerate and vibrate. As they collide, their temperature rises. This heating process is known as ohmic heating. Think of how an electric heater works. As current flows through its resistive wires, they heat up and warm the surrounding area. Similarly, as ions in the plasma accelerate and collide, resistance increases, resulting in a rise in temperature. With ohmic heating alone, the plasma temperature can reach 10 to 20 million degrees Celsius. At this point, the electrons of deuterium and tritium separate from their nuclei, forming plasma. But there's a limit. Beyond 20 million degrees, the central solenoid can no longer accelerate the ions enough. This means the temperature increases, saturates, and while plasma forms, fusion still doesn't occur. To push the temperature further, we introduced another method, neural beam injection. In this technique, deuterium atoms are accelerated using magnetic fields to extremely high speeds, far greater than the speed of atoms inside the plasma. However, if these atoms remain charged, the superconducting magnets will deflect them, preventing them from entering the plasma. That's why before injection, the atoms are neutralized inside a neutralization chamber. Once neutral, these fast-moving atoms can enter the plasma unhindered. Inside, they collide with plasma particles, increasing their speed and energy, raising the temperature further. Each reactor typically uses two injectors, each delivering around 16.5 megawatt of energy to the plasma. With NBI heating, the temperature rises to between 20 and 80 million degrees Celsius. To go even further, two types of radio wave heating are applied, called ICRH and ECRH. These use different frequencies, but both inject high-frequency radio waves into the plasma. When the frequency of these waves match the natural vibration of plasma atoms, resonance occurs. 
Through this resonance, about 20 megawatt of energy is transferred to the plasma atoms, causing even more intense vibrations. As a result, the plasma's temperature soars to 100 million degrees Celsius, the ideal condition for atoms to finally undergo fusion. So in simple terms, the central solenoid NBI heating and radio frequency heating all work together to raise the plasma temperature to fusion conditions. Meanwhile, the external superconducting magnets ensure the plasma doesn't touch the reactor walls. Once plasma forms, its atoms move at extremely high speeds. They begin to collide and fuse. When deuterium and tritium fuse, they form helium-4, a neutron, and release 17.6 MeV of energy. The neutron produced has very high energy and no electrical charge, so it's unaffected by the magnetic field. It escapes the plasma and flies outward at high speed. I believe the flashlight that beams from Tony Stark's suit is nothing but a plasma stream, and if it existed on Earth, it would destroy everything in its path. Let's now understand this concept layer by layer. At the center is plasma. The first layer surrounding the plasma is called the blanket, or first wall. It's made from lithium isotopes, lithium-6 and lithium-7. Since this layer receives extreme heat from plasma, it's shielded by beryllium tiles, which can withstand both heat and radiation. Beryllium also acts as a neutron multiplier. When a neutron from the plasma strikes a beryllium atom, it splits into two neutrons, amplifying their reaction. These beryllium tiles are bonded with copper and stainless steel. Copper absorbs and spreads heat efficiently, while stainless steel provides strong structural support and protection. Neutrons serve two roles here. First, their high energy heats the blanket, providing thermal energy. Second, when they hit lithium-6 or lithium-7, they produce tritium, which becomes fuel for future reactions. So the blanket isn't just capturing heat, it's also producing new fuel for the reactor. As the blanket absorbs heat, it must be cooled. Behind it lies a shield block, which supports the first wall and contains cooling water channels to remove the heat. This heated water flows to a heat exchanger, where it turns into steam. The steam turns turbine blades, generating electricity, much like conventional thermal power plants. What makes a fusion reactor special is that it converts mass directly into energy, delivering clean power. One of its main byproducts is helium a safe, non-toxic gas that is highly useful and in demand. Liquid helium is already used to cool superconducting magnets in MRI machines, and is valuable in spacecraft technology due to its thermal properties. So yes, fusion promises clean energy, though some hurdles still remain. Until now, only China has managed to maintain 100 million degrees Celsius for over a thousand seconds in a reactor. Even then, there's a limitation. The superconducting magnets and the central magnet require enormous power to create plasma. So far, no country has managed to extract more output energy than what is consumed, meaning we're still in the net negative phase. However, by 2035, global scientists aim to cross this threshold, achieving net positive output energy. This video covered many technical details. If you have any questions or suggestions, feel free to drop them in the comments. Visit our channel to explore more fascinating engineering and technology videos. Thank you.